Take your Bible with me and turn to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and we'll pick up in uh, verse number 11 where we left off last week. But in order to get a good grip on uh, verse number 11, you've got to read verse 10. So let's start at verse 10. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgive anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Verse number 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. God does not want you to be ignorant to Satan's devices because he has a lot of evil, wicked, devious, deviant devices that he will use on your life, your ministry, your family, your church, yourself. He has lots of different tools that he uses. And most of the time they don't change. You see, he's not like a human being where he's lived and, and, and died. He's been around for generation after generation after generation after generation. Learning how we work, how we think, how we act. And so his devices, God says, he does not want you to be ignorant of Satan's devices. Amen. He wants you to know what Satan tool, Satan's tools are, what he's going to use, how he's going to attack you. And he's telling you right here, how many times in verse number 10 did it say forgive and forgave? How important is it that you forgive? You have got to learn. Do you hear what I said? Learn to forgive. Does it come naturally? No, it does not. But it does come supernaturally. It does come from God working through you. When you realize that you can't do it and you got to have Christ to help you do it and so he can do it in and through you, you are starting to learn how to forgive. And the Bible says what? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, just as there is a, a danger in a church for not having some disciplinary action, there's a huge danger for not exercising forgiveness. When somebody is truly repentant and truly sorry and truly wants to make it right, and truly wants to make a change, there is a giant, there is a giant danger when that person is not forgiven. Satan is always ready to step into a, a situation with his devices and put a wedge in between Christians, put a wedge in between ministries, Put a wedge in between families. Put a wedge in between a marriage. With How does he do that? Well, when you don't forgive, the Satan, Satan has a giant wedge that he can start to drive with a hammer each and every time that you think about that person, you think about that act, you think about what happened, you remember how it went down, you remember where it happened, what happened, what was said. He's constantly, he's hammering that wedge deeper and deeper and driving it further and further in your home, in your ministry, in your house, uh, in your church. The Bible says in verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. So in, in, in the first case, if, if a church's disciplinary is not exercised uh, and sin is just tolerated, well, there's a, there's a big danger there for Satan to come in and just destroy things. But there's just as much danger when people don't forgive one another. So many churches split. So many bad things happen. So many family members don't have nothing to do with each other anymore. Marriages break up. Uh, siblings don't talk to each other anymore. All kinds of things like that because people don't forgive. And I felt it myself. You don't know what they said. You don't know what they did. You don't know how bad it was. You was not there. You don't know how it felt. But let me just tell you, no, I don't. I don't know how it felt. But Christ knows how it felt. Christ can help you through that. I can, but you open up God's word. I'm simply a, a humble servant delivering a message from him. But if you'll get with him and spend time in his word talking to you and you talking to him, God can help you with that, amen? Because certain things are just horrendous. Certain things, there may be times when you should never be involved with that person again. But if you don't forgive, it will 
it will just be like uh, acid eating away at your skin. It will eat away at your heart and it will destroy you from the inside out. And you say, but I'm a strong person. Do you know how nations, really strong nations are destroyed? Like take Rome, for example, the, one of the strongest nations there was at that time on the planet. Nobody could destroy them. But do you know what happened? They destroyed themselves from the inside out. And that is my fear for America, that we will destroy ourselves from the inside out. We are such a superpower. God has blessed us so much. But this is a personal application here. This is not talking about that. That's a side trail, a, a rabbit I was chasing. But I chased it and I killed it. We're done with that. Let's get back to this. This is about a ministry, about a home, about you personally learning uh, to forgive. Why? Because so you, you don't need to be ignorant of Satan's devices, the Bible says. God wants you to know what Satan uses. Look with me now, verse number 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Verse 13, I had no rest in my spirit because I could not find Titus, my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. You know, as mentioned before, Paul left Ephesus and journeyed to Troas of his hope to, and meeting Titus there. There is strength and brotherhood coming together. That's what the Bible says. Iron sharpeneth iron. And when you're around people that are like-minded of the like faith, amen, it does strengthen you. It does sharpen you. It does give you more courage, amen. And so here, Paul was going out to Troas, hoping to see his brother in Christ, Titus. But when he got to Troas, some, you know, there were some wonderful doors open, some opportunities for him to share the Lord Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, Paul's going to take advantage of that, as me and you should. And there's a good lesson to be learned there. When you're going to do something because you want to do it and God opens a door, Always go through that door that God has opened because maybe you didn't see it. Maybe you didn't even pray for that door, but God opened that door and you should utilize it. You should walk through it. God did not open that door in your life so that you could walk by it or so that you could look in there and say, wow, there's a lot of good things going on in there. No, God opened that door for you to go in there and to do his work, to preach the gospel, to spread the, the word of the Lord Jesus Christ or whatever it is that not all people are called to preach. Some are just called to be served. Some are just called to be faithful church members. Some are called to be preachers. Some are called to work in a nursery. Some are called to mow the grass. Some are called to just be faithful tithers of the church. Amen. But we all have a have a, a job to do within the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we all have different abilities. Some are very skilled workers. Some are very skilled laborers. Some are do well, very well financially in life and are able to give mightily unto the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. All those are great gifts. It takes all those to make the church work. Amen? All members are of equal value, but not all are the same. Not all are the same. Look at me now, verse number 13. He said, I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from them into Macedonia. So in spite of that golden opportunity, Paul spoke, still troubled uh, in his spirit. He wanted to meet his friend Titus, his brother in Christ, but Christ obviously had some different plans for him as Christ may have different plans for you. As I said, always walk through the door that the Lord opens. And I know within my life, a lot of times those doors come when I don't expect them. Sometimes they come when I might not even feel like I want it. But God says, I open that door. That door is for you to serve me, and I expect you to walk through that door. And ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to stand before God and say, God, I didn't do that. Even though you opened the door and you led the way and you had the funds and you laid it out, I just, I didn't feel like it on that day. I do not want to stand before God and have a feeling like that or a saying like that. I do want to say, I do want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So it's not about our feelings. We have to lay our feelings down and pick up the facts that God wants us to serve him. Amen. That's what Paul did here. Look with me now in verse 14. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes, causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest 
the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Paul was not defeated. No matter where he went in the service of Lord Jesus Christ, there was victory. Thanks be to God, he always leads us to victory. It may not be the victory that you had in your mind, but listen to me. There are many things that we will not ever learn or know about until we get into heaven, until we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, when you do what he tells you to do, there is always victory because it is him. It is him that is doing the work and not you. You are simply being obedient to what God is telling you. So Paul here, he borrows a figure uh, from the Roman conquerors, you know, that they went around in battle. And a lot of times when they came back home, they, they would bring those that they had conquered with them in chains and, and march them through the street in victory. In other words, look what I've done. And they would have a, a fragrance and uh, things burning that you could, you could smell that smelled good, that smelled like victory, right? And so they would know there was, there was a victory. And when you serve Christ, there is a savor that God smells of victory, that you can smell of victory. The feeling is in the air. And so wherever the Lord goes through his servants, there's victory. Well, what about that missionary that went to the, to the island that they, the, the indigenous people there that were Indians murdered them. They couldn't speak English. You listen to me. Wherever the Lord goes through his servants, there is victory. If God sent you there, even if you lose your life, there is victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because you obeyed what God told you to do. The Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. If you lose your life, if you lose your reputation, if you lose whatever, all your money, all your funds, all your home, all your car, none of that stuff matters. Many times we think of blessings of somebody gave us some money or we got a house or we got a nice car, we got a nice job, we got a job title, we got this, we got that. Those aren't the blessings, ladies and gentlemen. Those aren't the real blessings. The real blessings are peace, joy, love, happiness. The real blessings are yet to come when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and he gives us those crowns, even though we're not worthy, even though we'll cast them at your feet. Can you imagine God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, handing you a crown for your service that you did for him? Amen. Glory to God to that. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And he hands you a crown. And now that's a blessing right there. That's the blessing that I'm looking for. I'm not looking for the money or the title, the position or the home or the power or the prestige or any of that other garbage, but I am looking to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because those are the real treasures. Those are the real victories. And those are the ones that will last throughout all eternity. The money that you get, the car that you get, the house you get, all that stuff is going to be burned up. It'll be nothing, null and void. Wood, hay, and stubble, the Bible says. But the things that you did with for Christ will last through all eternity. Like that Bible says, the savor, the savor of victory, the savor of victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. The, the, the fragrance of the incense meant glorious mm -hmm. victory. When they walked through the streets and they could smell that incense, that they knew that meant there was victory. They could smell it in the air. And the preaching, you know, the preaching of the gospel has a twofold effects. Among those that are saved, that are that are going to be saved, it is the power of God and the salvation. But of those that reject the gospel, those that turn from God, those that want nothing to do with it, it is a message of doom for them because they are rejecting the one thing that can save them from a place called hell. They're turning their back on it. They're saying, I don't want that. And thank God for his mercy. Just because somebody rejects the gospel one time does not mean they won't get saved the second time that they hear it or the second time that God calls them. Amen. I, I know I'm a product of that. I didn't get saved at a young age. I got saved when I was older. And thank God for his mercy. Thank God he didn't give up on me. But I knew 
when I heard the gospel, even when I wasn't saved, that if, if I didn't really repent of my sins and put my faith in the trust of the Lord Jesus Christ and get born again like the Bible says, that I would wind up in a place called hell. And so that preaching of the gospel to those that are, that are saved or those that are going to get saved is the power of God unto salvation. But there's another message for those that reject it. We may be to God a sweet savor of, of Christ. Amen. I certainly want to be that. I want to be a sweet savor that God smells through the Lord Jesus Christ for the work that I want to do for Jesus. Do you know that God watches our moral character each and every day. God watches us from day to day. And when he sees us, when he looks down upon us, he said, see and smell Jesus. Amen. We should look like him, act like him, walk like him, and talk like him. And I realize it's a struggle. I realize things get mad. I, I, I realize you get, you get mad or you throw a fit or this happened or that happened or they did this. But the truth is, that we should be striving for that, that when God sees us, he sees and smells Jesus, amen, to be a sweet savor, like the Bible says, a sweet savor of Christ. Look at verse 16. To one, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the savor of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things to the saved Christians are the aroma of life amen like when a preacher's preaching you can feel in your heart the Holy Spirit is telling you in your heart that's true that's true that's true that's true that's God speaking to your spirit the Holy Spirit speaking to you saying what that man is preaching is not that man that's God talking through him. That's God's word. That's right. That's correct. And you can shout out, amen, because it's true. So to the saved, us Christians are the aroma of life leading to life, like the Bible says. But to the perishing, it's the aroma of death leading to death. Think about that. The aroma. The Bible says that we are the savor of death unto death have you ever been driving along and all of a sudden you get this horrendous smell and you just know there's something dead I mean it's reeks it's bad you, you, you've been drove past it for miles and you can still smell it in your car it just stinks to high heaven and especially a skunk you know that the moment you just get a barely whiff of it you go whoo man Somebody done hit a stunt, a skunk, he's dead, he's been dead, and he's going to be dead. And you smell him for miles and miles and miles. Even though you passed him 10 miles back, you can still smell him. Death is a rotten, stinking thing. But the Bible says to the one, we are the savor of death unto death. Do you know there's certain people you're going to meet that are going to just hate your guts? just because you're a Christian. You don't have to tell them you're a Christian. You don't have to wear a sign or a T-shirt or hold up a Bible. They just know. Because let me tell you, there is some demonic forces that are driving some people, and they, they may turn out to hate a Christian, and they don't even know really know why they hate them, but they hate their guts. They can't stand to see them, smell them, be around them, get close to them, talk to them, work with them, nothing. I hate them. Why? Well, listen to this verse again. To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. Just like that skunk that's been dead on the road for weeks, days. You don't want to be around it. You want to get away from it. I can't stand it. It's burning my nose hairs. My eyeballs are bleeding. And my eyes are watering and my ears are hurting and my nose is burnt. I got to get out of here. Can I just say that that's how some people will feel around you because you're saved, because you're born again, because the Holy Spirit of God lives within you? The Bible says to the one we are the savor of death unto death because you look like Christ, because you smell like Christ, because you act like Christ, because you 
are a representation of Christ on this earth. That's what the word Christian means, to be Christ-like. To that person, you are the savior of death unto death, and they want nothing to do with you, and they don't want to be around you. We are what Philip calls the refreshing fragrance of life to some others. To what Paul says here, that we, we are the sweet smell of, of life to other Christians. Don't you know that's why it's good to be around other Christians? It's refreshing. You, It makes you feel good. It strengthens your spirit. It makes you strong in Christ. It makes you want to serve Christ even more because they have encouraged you in the word, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? You are encouraged by that. It gives you strength. It's the savor of, of life, the Bible says. What a, what a contrast. To one, you smell like death. To another, you smell like life and life everlasting. What a contrast that is. Make sure that you're living it out each and every day. I didn't come up with it, but I heard a preacher said, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to prosecute you in the law? And so I ask you that. Is there enough evidence in your life that people know you're a Christian without you telling them you're a Christian? Do people see it? Is it written all over you? Do people smell it when they see you coming? Do they smell life or do they smell death? And can I just say that one that does smell death, hey, they can easily, easily get born again. You may be the only Bible that they ever read when they, they see you and they see what kind of person you are and they see how you act and they see how you treat others and they see how what happens when you get mad and they see what happens when others try you. They are watching every move and every word that you use. Make sure that you're doing all you can to be the, the aroma, the savor of life that they may too taste of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Look at me now in our last verse. Verse number 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but, uh, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we Christ. You know, there's a connection between verse 16 and 17 that's best understood like this. We are. We are as many. We are. We are. Christians, we are wanting to serve the God. And we're not like those that want to corrupt the word of God. As there are many, make sure that you're putting God first. Make sure that you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure that you're the Savior of life to many. Amen.